Good evening and a very warm welcome to you here to St. Margaret's Church in Westminster Abbey on behalf of the Dean and Chapter of Westminster. My name is Anthony Ball and I'm the Canon Rector at the Abbey. I sit on the steering group for, uh, for the Institute and uh, also am responsible for uh, overseeing parliamentary services and events here in St. Margaret's Church, which many of you will know uh, is often uh, called the Parish Church of the House of Commons or the Parish Church of Parliament. And uh, tonight's lecture is uh, one of the events that we are using uh, here at the Abbey to mark 500 years since the consecration of this uh, present building that you see around you. Uh, St. Margaret's uh, Church has been here on this site since uh, the 12th century uh, when it was built for the local uh, people, the society that was beginning to form and extend around the uh, great uh, palace of Westminster and uh, Abbey Church. Uh, so that great uh, con conjoining of the, uh, of the secular power and the religious uh, power in the land. And the Benedictine monks built here a church for that uh, society which was in disrepair by the 15th century. So we're beginning to get a theme, society, great society, getting a little bit in disrepair, uh, and uh, was almost entirely reconstructed. I think Bishop Graham might be suggesting something of that this evening. Uh, almost entirely reconstructed, and the church uh, we see now was consecrated in uh, April 1523. So it's, uh, it's very fitting that we should have a lecture here uh, on Christianity in public life, how faith can help build a stronger society here within these walls that have witnessed so much uh, political and social change over the past 500 years. Uh, walls that themselves are uniquely located, surrounded here on Parliament Square by many of the UK's institutions of state that play such a major role in public life. Uh, Whitehall, the Supreme Court, Number 10 Downing Street, uh, the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard, just uh, sneaking behind uh, um, on, the, on the Thames, and of course, the Palace of Westminster, Parliament, uh, with whom this church has such a special and long-standing relationship. So tonight's lecture uh, considers the role of Christianity in a public landscape that continues to change. It explores the relevance of the Christian faith to some of our most pressing cultural crises. And I can think of no one better to lead us through this territory than the Right Reverend Dr. Graham Tomlin, Director of the Centre for Cultural Witness. And you will find much more of his distinguished biography in the notes on your, uh, on your chairs. But the centre that he now leads was established just over a year ago, based at uh, Lambeth Palace, to uh, for pursue a mission of retelling the transformative Christian story in public. And we are delighted that he's here to do just that for us tonight. So please welcome me in, uh, join me in welcoming Bishop Graham Thomas. Thank you, Anthony, very much indeed, and uh, thank you for your welcome. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honour to be here to give this lecture, and I'm very grateful to uh, Westminster Abbey Institute for inviting me to speak on this um, really important theme around um, 
faith in public life. And the, the uh, theme for this series of lectures is that of dignity in public service. I want to touch upon that theme as we go through uh, this evening. So the title for my uh, lecture this evening is How Faith, and by that I mean specifically Christian faith, although I will touch on the role of other faiths within this story as I go through, but how faith and Christian faith can help build a stronger society. 34 years ago, in 1989, the American academic Francis Fukuyama famously wrote an essay entitled The End of History. At that particular moment in Western history, or in global history, we might say, he suggested that Western liberal democracy had triumphed to the extent that it no longer had any serious rivals. Fascism had been revealed for the destructive and deeply unattractive force that it was through the outcome of the Second World War. In 1989, communism had now seemingly crumbled in the ruins of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall as it was torn down by the very people who was, that it was created to keep apart. And now there seemed only one option left. History as an antagonistic struggle between different forces was perhaps at something of an end. Secular, free market, Western liberal democracy was the only game in town. Looking back today, over those 34 years, however, there is an awful lot that has happened to undermine this vision of an assured liberal future for the world. First, there was, of course, the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City in 2001, which showed us all that religion had not gone away as a powerful motivation for action, for better or for worse. At the same time, the huge growth of Islam around the world and, of course, the gradual recognition in the West of the astonishing growth of Christianity in China and Africa in the last decades of the 20th century and its widespread social effects put paid to any assumption that the global future was unquestionably secular. Then there was the 2008 financial crash and the banks that came tumbling down in its wake, the mortgages that defaulted, the savings of ordinary people across the world that were lost. And all of that questioned the dogma that unfettered markets would somehow deliver economic prosperity and justice for all. Then there was the rise of China and its growing influence around the world. China overtook Japan to become the world's second largest economy in 2011. And this was a warning that the future may not, after all, lie with Western powers. If the 19th century had been called the British century, where Britain ruled the waves, the 20th century, the American century, where US culture was dominant, maybe the 21st century might be called the Chinese century, where China takes the most prominent place in global influence. And then, of course, there was the earthquake of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump in 2016, which took many, so many people by surprise. And it was, of course, another blow to the liberal dream as localism reasserted itself against the globalized world. And in subsequent years since then, new populist governments were elected in European countries such as Hungary, Brazil, Italy, and others. And more recently, Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine was another reminder of the threats to the liberal world order. And of course, we are now much more conscious of the specter of climate change than we were in 1989. Now, the result of all this is a far less stable world than Fukuyama envisaged all those years ago. Or, let's be honest, most of us did, as we watched the apparent end of European communism and a bright new future beckoned us all into the light. In fact, we are now more likely to think of ourselves as in a time of crisis and confusion rather than stability and peace. And tonight, I want to try to describe the sense of crisis that we perhaps experience today, which, as I see it, takes at least three distinct forms. And then I want to argue that a revived and renewed Christianity is a powerful resource in our society to, ex to address exactly those crises and to build the social fabric that might see us through them. 
Now, over this past summer, a number of major news stories highlighted these three crises for me and their impact upon our common life. The first was the story of Lucy Letby, the nurse in the Countess of Chester Hospital who was convicted of killing seven babies in her care and attempting to murder six others. The story was shocking. The idea of someone deliberately setting out to kill defenceless babies is hard to get our minds around. She was, of course, sentenced to jail to life in jail without parole, one of only four women in the UK to be given a whole life sentence, life in prison with no hope of ever getting out. I once met one of the other three, Joanna Dennehy, who was jailed for killing three of her boyfriends with a pocket knife, apparently with no remorse. When I was Bishop of Kensington, I would regularly visit prisons in my area, including Bronzefield Prison, which holds some of the UK's most dangerous female criminals. When I met her, she was handing out hymn books at the back of the prison chapel. And despite tattoos on her face and a blank look, she was barely distinguishable from some of the other prisoners or many people you might meet on the street. At the time of her conviction, the police struggled to understand the motive behind her crimes concluding that she seemed to do it just for fun. And in a strangely similar but sometimes different way, it was hard to understand any motive behind Lucy Letby's killing of these babies, a factor that makes the case even more confusing and chilling. However, although these two women have some similarities, there is something unique about Lucy Letby that has a wider resonance for us. It is the fact that she was a nurse. Now, hospitals are places we go to get better. We submit ourselves to the advice and wisdom of medical practitioners, accepting that they are working for our good and trusting them to keep to their promise, to benefit their patients according to their greatest ability and judgment and to do no harm or injustice to them, as the Hippocratic Oath puts it. And when a member of that very profession uses her access to vulnerable babies to murder them, it strikes at the very heart of public trust. During the COVID pandemic, a tidal wave of thanksgiving was expressed towards the NHS, with many of us clapping and banging pots outside our homes on Thursday evenings to express gratitude to those who were risking their lives to treat victims of COVID. In an age where trust in institutions had taken a battering, the NHS was one of our national institutions that people regarded most highly and trusted most explicitly. And so for a registered nurse to commit these crimes shook our trust in the NHS systems that allowed such killing to happen, just as did the crimes of Harold Shipman back in the 1970s through to the 1990s. But this, however, is just the latest in a number of crises that have eroded trust in public institutions over recent decades. The parliamentary expenses scandal back in 2009 eroded trust in politicians, which is always at something of a low. The Ipsos Veracity Index is the longest running poll on trust in professions in British life. The 2022 version suggested that trust in politicians had fallen seven percentage points in the past year, making them the least trusted profession in Britain. Now, these results presumably reflected some of the political merry-go-round of 2021, when we had three prime ministers in a very short period of time, after all the convulsions of Brexit, the upheavals of the pandemic, and the scandal of parties in number 10 while the country was in lockdown. But it's not all bad news for politicians. They're not the only ones to be mistrusted. Advertising executives, estate agents, and journalists all score pretty low on public trust. We clergy come somewhere in the middle of the professions, not as well trusted as doctors, but doing a little bit better than the estate agents. But nurses and doctors are always at the top of this particular league table, which is why the Lucy Letby case was so shocking for us. Can we not even trust the medics? Now, my awareness of the politicians I know would suggest that theirs is an undeserved reputation. And yet, it is striking that there is something of a crisis of trust in our public institutions, in politicians, in the mainstream media, 
business leaders, bankers, journalists, and so on. Now, much of this may be exacerbated by social media, which operates as an amplification system for gossip and the spreading of rumor. The polarization of contemporary life with increasingly angry exchanges on social media increases a lack of trust across the barriers of the culture war, with different tribes viewing others with the hostility of distrust. And yet there are deeper reasons for this crisis of trust. The liberal world order that seemed to have won the day in 1989 emerged from a particular view of freedom that itself emerged from the European Enlightenment of the 18th century. These new ideas saw the individual as the basic unit of society. And freedom entailed liberation from the stifling authority of the past. Institutions such as the monarchy, the church, or even for someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, government itself imposing laws upon us were seen as restrictions on personal individual autonomy. The social contract was expounded in the thought of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, whereby individual freedoms were given up for the sake of sake of social harmony, left behind a rather reluctant acceptance of social ties and bonds rather than a glad and willing delight in them. Now, more recently, a postmodern analysis of figures such as the French philosopher Michel Foucault taught us to see the power dynamics behind any social interaction and therefore to be suspicious of them. We are a society that has lost its deference to authority and leadership. As Foucault described how he thought power operated in prisons, in mental institutions, in our understanding of sexuality and so on, he didn't really offer us any positive vision of the future but just wanted us to be aware of who is exercising power over us. As he once put it, my point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous. Now, not all of this is without reason. The powerful institutions of the past have not always behaved with wisdom and for the full benefit of all the people that they serve, as evidenced by our history of racism, the abuse of power, and the undervaluing of women and minority groups. And yet, the result of all this is this lack and crisis of trust in our national institutions. Trust is at a low ebb in our societies. However, trust is one of the most important building blocks of a society. We need to be able to trust those who look after our health, who police our streets, who look after our money, the people who make laws that govern our life together. A society filled with distrust cannot function well. It descends into a morass of suspicion, recrimination, accusation, polarization. Exactly what you find when you spend too much time on Twitter. A crisis of trust is a real problem. Now, the second story which revealed something about our life together was the many stories of climate-related events which affected the life of millions in this past year. In Canada, for example, the summer of 2023 saw its most destructive ever recorded wildfire season. By the beginning of September, more than 6,000 separate fires had torched a staggering 16.5 million hectares of land in Canada. That's an area larger than Greece, and more than double that recorded in the second most drastic year back in 1989. Greece itself faced the longest heat wave in living memory, with temperatures reaching a 50-year high in July. Southern Europe, the USA, and North Africa experienced extraordinarily high temperatures. Now, whether or not these were the effects of climate change, they certainly increased the sense of anxiety around the future of life on our planet for many people, especially amongst the young. And so, alongside a crisis of trust, we have a crisis of anxiety. An increasing number of people are refusing to have children because they feel it's an irresponsible thing to do to bring a new life into the world which will have its own carbon footprint damaging the world even further. Many also speak of not wanting to bring children into such a hopeless and damaged world. One 27-year-old woman said, I feel like I can't in good conscience bring a child into this world and force them to try and survive what may be apocalyptic conditions. A recent survey found 96% of 27 to 45 year olds were either very or extremely concerned about the well-being of their potential future children in a climate changed world. 
And it's not just climate change which brings a sense of anxiety. In recent years, we've experienced what some have called a decade of disruption. Brexit deeply divided the UK. The global pandemic shut down normal life for two years. The death of George Floyd triggers, triggered a deep sense of soul searching in Western societies on the history of racism. And we now face both the cost of living crisis in the present and looming fears over the impact of AI and technology for the future. In global terms, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the increasing power and influence of China across the world, and the recent flare-up of the interminable crisis of Israel and Gaza, which threatens to draw in other regional powers, which exacerbates the fault lines of the culture wars, all fosters a sense of global uncertainty. Military experts tell us we are increasingly seeing proxy wars where states fund militant groups in other states, encouraging conflict, all to shape their own regions and achieve their national ambitions. They also tell us that we are entering a new era of a nuclear arms race, both in the modernization of current capabilities amongst the five nuclear powers of the UN Security Council, but also among other countries, also modernizing or wanting to have their own weapons. Defence budgets across the world are rapidly increasing. And even traditionally reluctant countries like Japan to militarise are doubling or tripling their defence expenditure and entering into new alliances. The risks of an escalation between different states, intended or unintended today, seem higher than ever. Add into that this renewed escalation of tension between Israelis and Palestinians, a conflict as likely as any, to spark off a regional conflict, drawing in wider nations and powers, and you can understand a heightened sense of anxiety for many. So the result of all this is that levels of anxiety and uncertainty are greater than we've seen in previous generations, especially amongst the young. Nearly one third of 16 to 24 year olds in the UK report some evidence of depression or anxiety about the future, and the figures are rising. We are seeing not just a crisis of trust, but a crisis of anxiety and a questioning of whether we have any future worth looking forward to. The third story that was prominent over the summer was the increase in the number of refugees landing on these shores, seeking a new life in the United Kingdom. Small boat arrivals accounted for around 45% of the asylum applications made in the UK in 2022. In total, Nearly 46,000 migrants crossed the channel last year, the highest number since figures began to be collected in 2018. That number had been already reached by June of this year, so the figure this year is much higher. As a result, a record 175,000 people are waiting in the UK for a decision on an asylum claim. That's an increase of nearly half since June 2022. Of course, the question of the extent to which our borders should be open is a real political hot potato. The Prime Minister has made it one of his policy objectives to stop the flow of illegal boats crossing the Channel. Now, answers to these questions and consensus on the way to deal with the mass flow of migration is hard to come by. However, the increasing number of people knocking on the door of Western European countries, especially the UK, raises the age-old question, who is my neighbour? How do we relate to those who want to come here? Is my primary responsibility to my immediate neighbours in my street or town or city or country? Or is it equally to desperate refugees wanting to make a life here? And what do I do if those calls on me clash? And all this brings what we might call a crisis of relationship. Now again, here there are deeper reasons for this crisis of relationship. A routine trope in the liberal world order that's been challenged recently was John Stuart Mill's principle of harm. Mill famously argued that the only valid reason for interfering with another person's liberty of interest of action is to protect them from physical harm or to protect them from from harming someone else. It is never justifiable to interfere with another person's freedom to ensure their happiness, wisdom or well-being because that is to determine what that person's well-being is. Freedom from ill was defined as liberty of conscience, thought, feeling and opinion. As he put it, liberty of tastes and pursuits, doing as we like, without impediment from our fellow creatures, so long as what we do does not harm them. 
For Mill, one of the main ingredients of social pro progress is, of course, freedom from the traditions and customs imposed by others, both, both the past constraints of tradition and the present ones of custom, which restrict the cultivation of individuality, which for him is one of the leading essentials of well-being. Individual li liberty, he says, is vital, not just for the sake of the individual, but for the sake of human progress. Without individual liberty, there will be no originality or genius, no new discoveries or innovation. It's a powerful and influential argument. There is, however, I think, a problem with it. The problem is what it does to our social relations, how it makes me view my neighbour. If freedom is essentially my liberty to say or do what I like, as long as I don't tread on the toes of my neighbour, then what does that do to my relationship with my neighbour? He or she becomes, at best, a limitation, or at worst, a threat to my freedom. There may be all kinds of things I want to do, play music loud on a summer's night, or drive my car at 100 miles per hour on a quiet suburban road, but I can't because I might disturb my neighbour's peace or risk crashing into an oncoming bus. Or even worse, my neighbour might want to play her music too loud for me, or drive her car too fast in my direction, thus invading my personal space. This approach keeps the peace between us, but at the cost of making us see each other, either as irritating limitations to our desires, which of course divine our self-chosen goals in life, or threats to our own precious autonomy. It explains why we sometimes tend to see refugees as a problem, a threat to our freedom, rather than what might possibly be a potential gift to us. The result of all this is a world in which we feel no great obligation to care for our neighbour. And arguably issues in the well-documented increase in levels of loneliness and isolation in modern life. If we lack a basic framework of life and thinking, which lays an obligation on us to care for our neighbours, especially the disadvantaged ones, it won't necessarily give us easy or good answers when it comes to questions like the refugee crisis but it certainly hampers us in responding wise, wisely. So we have, in modern life, I would argue, a crisis of trust in our public institutions, of anxiety as we look into the future, and of relationships as we look across to our neighbour, both within our immediate communities and beyond to the disadvantaged in our world. Now, if we were to state these three crises in more positive theological language, we might say we have a crisis of faith a crisis of hope, and a crisis of love. Now this triad of virtues was of course originally put together by St Paul in his famous 13th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, read out in many a marriage service. The crisis of trust could be described as a lack of faith in our public institutions. A crisis of anxiety stems from a lack of hope for the future, and a crisis of relationship stems from a failure in our love for one another. Now, of course, Christian faith has had a lot to say about faith, hope, and love over the years. When the great St. Augustine set himself the task of writing a simple manual or handbook of the Christian life addressed to a younger disciple called Laurentius in around the year 420 AD, he called it an enchiridion, and the subtitle was a manual concerning faith, hope, and love. That's what he felt the Christian faith was about. And he thought that a summary of Christian life must outline what must be believed, what hoped for, and what loved. And so for Augustine, as for so many other Christians, Christian faith could be described as a way of living, feeling, thinking, and praying that generates a capacity for faith, hope, and love over the longer term. Engagement with the classic Christian disciplines will in time generate an increasing capacity for trust, it has the potential to decrease levels of anxiety and to build capacity to love. But this, of course, is not to deny that other faiths do not have very valuable things to offer our society and our social fabric. But as a Christian, tonight in what remains of this lecture, I want to outline how I think Christian faith sets out to do these things and how it therefore offers a resource, a vital, valuable resource for our society in building precisely the virtues we need to address these crises in our modern life. First, we consider faith. Faith 
or trust, if you like, is at the heart of Christian practice and belief. Perhaps the greatest thinker on the nature of faith in Christian history was the great German reformer Martin Luther, with his famous assertion of the doctrine of justification by faith as the very centre of Christianity. It was for him the article by which the church stands or falls. Now, for Luther, faith was not abstract assent to particular propositions. It wasn't ticking off the articles of the creed as a purely intellectual or mental exercise, but it was a matter of personal trust. Just as human trust comes down to the question of whether we trust another person's word, whether we consider them to be trustworthy or not, faith in God comes down to the same thing. Now, Luther knew that we are by nature distrustful creatures, and therefore trust is something that needs to be drawn out of us elicited by something fundamentally trustworthy. And therefore, for him, faith was built through trusting the promise of God. In the Bible, and in particular in the gift of Jesus Christ, which is the heart of the Bible's message, God has once and for all committed himself to us, even to the point of dying for us. And therefore, Luther would say, even when everything else looks dark, when even God feels far away, it is still possible to trust that God is fundamentally on our side. As Luther once put it, this we must realize in death and in the depths and in doubt. I have this promise that I shall live, no matter how terribly death crowds in upon me. Trust has to be built. We talk about winning the trust of other people. And Luther would argue God wins our trust by being trustworthy by being faithful, by pledging himself to us once and for all through the gift of Christ to the human race, which can never be revoked. Christian practices such as reading the Bible, attending the Holy Eucharist, listening to sermons, praying the Lord's Prayer is a process of character formation which generates deeper trust in God. And this newly learned quality would begin to seep into other aspects of life, including an ability to trust other people. A belief that behind all the changes and chances, the ups and downs of a normal human life, lies a God whose love is constant and whose purposes are good, can and often does lead to a more trusting attitude to life. It is like a child brought up in a family where her parents can be trusted to care for her, seek the best for her, and whose words are reliable. That child is likely to extend that same element of trust to others as she begins to venture out into the wider world. Of course, she will come across untrustworthy people where her sense of trust will be damaged, but the fundamental trajectory of her life is set. Over time, wisdom means discerning whose promises can be trusted and whose should not be. Yet a good upbringing in a trusting environment leads to an instinct and a bias towards trust rather than distrust. She will approach other people with a default assumption to trust them unless there is good evidence not to do so, rather than an instinctive attitude of distrust, a cold, suspicious attitude that won't easily trust anybody. Now, the same is true in Christian practice. Learning to trust God, believing that we live in a world which is ultimately behind all its dangers, a safe place to live, builds trust, just as exercise builds muscles. This perspective on the world can embrace realism about human sinfulness, people who abuse our trust, but at the end of the day, nurtures an ability to give people the benefit of the doubt. And of course, often when people are trusted, they can sometimes prove themselves to be surprisingly trustworthy in, which, in ways that they have not yet shown. People entrusted with an important role can often rise to the challenge. Trusting people can often lead to them becoming trustworthy in a virtuous circle of faith. Next, we look at the Christian virtue of hope. Now, the Christian faith has as its central symbol one of the most terrible and grim forms of human cruelty that has ever been imagined. Crucifixion was all about deterrence. This was the might of the Roman army showing what happens to slaves who rebel, political activists who dare to challenge the might of the empire, 
and religious leaders with a message that seemed to undermine public stability. In the unjust condemnation and crucifixion of Jesus, the Christian story has at its heart an insight into the deep darkness of human life and experience. It is all the more remarkable, therefore, that faced with the depth of human cruelty, Christian faith is ultimately a religion of hope and salvation rather than grim despair at the injustice of the world. Now, the Christian capacity for hope is based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the power of that hope rests in the contrast. If God can bring life and a future out of the darkest moment of human history, when human beings killed God, then there is no situation that is beyond hope. Moreover, the resurrection of Jesus is the sign of something much greater, the resurrection of all things that will one day take place, the vision of a new heaven and a new earth that has inspired countless Christian millennial movements, as well as giving a light in the darkness in many an individual moment of despair. Belief in the resurrection, which is such a central aspect of Christian faith, has the capacity to increase a sense of hope. Some time ago, I asked probably one of the best known modern biblical scholars, N.T. Wright, to, ask, to write an article for our new website in the Center for Cultural Witness called seenandunseen.com. I asked him to write an article on Easter hope and climate change. He described how St. Paul saw this new heaven and new earth coming about one day by what he called a powerful, convulsive, fresh action of God. He then went on to write, Paul's claim could be summarized this way. God will do for the whole creation at the last what he did for Jesus at Easter. The message of the resurrection isn't just about God rewarding Jesus for his own terrible suffering, nor is it simply about there being hope beyond death for his followers. It is about new creation, a new world in which we are all invited to share, not just eventually, but already in the present. However, such a belief that God will one day renew his creation, despite all the harm we do to it in the present, does not mean that Christians sit back and wait for God to intervene. In fact, it is a stimulus to act out of that hope. N.T. Wright again, if Jesus represents the long-term hope of God's people arriving unexpectedly in advance in the present time, then part of the point is to equip people who follow him with his own spirit so they can be agents of new creation even in the present time. That means a vocation to be small working models of new creation, to engage in advance in the tasks of creation, care and renewal, and to encourage those working to address the major challenges of global warming and pollution. Now, such a view combines an urgency about addressing issues such as climate change without the despair and anguish that sometimes comes with a concern for the fate of our planet because it is grounded in hope that the creation will be renewed one day, that it will not simply fizzle away into nothingness along with all of us who live on this planet, but it will be renewed by a decisive act of God. Now, of course, that may seem inconceivable to those outside of Christian faith, but it is what Christians believe. And Christians, of course, would, always, would also point out that the existence of this world is pretty inconceivable. As a character in Marilyn Robinson's great novel, Gilead, puts it, this morning, I've been trying to think about heaven, but without much success. I don't know why I should expect to have any idea of heaven. After all, I could never have imagined this world if I hadn't spent almost eight decades walking around in it. And so finally, what about love? St. Paul's description of the Christian life as one of faith, hope, and love comes in the context of a chapter where he focuses upon love as the greatest of all these Christian virtues. The heart of Christian faith is an assertion that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and to rise again to bring about a new world. And so being a Christian means accepting that however much I may dislike myself or however much others may think badly of me, God loves me and that God loves me. It is that sudden realization that has transformed many a life, including many of those in the prisons of which I spoke earlier. And yet, just as important as the realization that God loves me, 
is the parallel belief that God also loves each person that I meet each day, my neighbor and my enemy, just as much, not more, and no less than he loves me. And this, for some of us, is not quite such a welcome message. The Jewish and Christian doctrine that every person is made in the image of God, and in particular the Christian idea that every person on the face of this planet is the object of God's love in Christ, means a transformation in our way of looking at other people. Love in Christian understanding is not a commandment, a kind of Kantian categorical imperative where we overcome ourselves and our disinclination to love, as Kant thought, to become truly ethical. The simple reason why love cannot be commanded is because, as we all know too well, it is very difficult to make yourself love something or someone that you just don't. In Christian understanding, to love the neighbor is not a command to be obeyed through gritted teeth, but it comes about through a transformation of heart and mind, which changes the way we see the neighbor. If my neighbor is ultimately someone worthy of divine love, which is much greater than mine, how can I withhold love from that person? Divine love bestows upon other people what the German Lutheran theologian Helmut Thielicke once described as an alien dignity. He said this is what people have, an alien dignity, which is not an imminent quality of character or anything else, but the splendor of another's love. When another person gets on my nerves, when I can no longer see the human being in him, but only a glitter of hatred for me, I must remember that he is one who was designed to be something, someone who was loved. Now that phrase, alien dignity, refers to a quality not within the person, so that we love them for their looks, their moral rectitude, their heroism or an attractive personality. It is a dignity, but an alien one, one that does not belong to us, but is given to us from the outside, the fact that we are loved despite ourselves. Now, this series of lectures is entitled Dignity and Pu Public Service. And here it seems is the heart of what I want to argue this evening. The Christian faith, by bestowing this alien dignity on each and every person in this nation or this planet, gives both a grounding and a motivation for love, the deepening bond of social bonds that makes for a stronger society, a, stro a society in which we do, to, do truly serve one another. It also means that this world has an alien dignity, one given to it from the outside rather than inherent within itself, which guarantees a hopeful future for this planet. It also encourages trust, as we learn to trust the God who bestows this alien dignity upon us. So I suggest Christian faith, when it's grasped in its fullness, has the potential to build our capacity for faith, for hope, and for love, exactly what our troubled culture and society need right now. And so to conclude, one of the things I notice about contemporary commentary is the increasing number of people recognizing the need to develop our, ca our capacity for virtue today. If a relatively prosperous culture like ours is one that experiences high levels of anxiety an expectation that the state will provide for us in every case and a tendency towards self-indulgence and maybe avoiding personal responsibility, what is needed is the development of virtue. And this doesn't just come from Christian thinkers. The huge growth of interest in Stoicism today with podcasts, books, Articles recommending Stoic philosophy as a means of handling the vicissitudes of life testify to this very need. The American ethicist Gilbert Mylander once wrote this. Successful moral education requires a community which does not hesitate to inculcate virtue in the young, which does not settle for the discordant opinions of alternative visions of the good, which worries about what the stories of its poets teach. It may, he goes on to say, in short, there can be very little serious moral education in a community which seeks only to be what we have come to call liberal. That may be a harsh verdict, but if liberalism is seen purely as a neutral space, 
imagining that it tells no particular story and does not take moral formation seriously, then it will not have the resources to face the challenges of our precarious times. However, if some of the virtues of liberalism, its tolerance of different opinion, its welcome of difference, can be held within a broader overarching story, such as that offered by Christian faith, then it may have a future. As Miley Ender says, it matters what stories our poets teach. The story told by the poets of the Bible has the capacity to rebuild those virtues of faith, hope and love. It has the capacity to build the resilience needed in our dangerous times. It has the capacity to develop our moral muscles of faith, hope and love and address our crises of trust, of anxiety and relationship. It is a vision that has built the foundations of our social life in past generations and it might just do so again. Thank you very much. I think you can uh, sense, Graham, the uh, appreciation for that um, uh, really uh, fascinating uh, insight and analysis of, of, as it were, where we are and some of the weaknesses of, of our society and uh, the encouraging picture you, uh, you offer of how we might uh, strengthen uh, and, and address some of those weaknesses. And, You've also very helpfully left us uh, 20, 25 minutes for uh, questions, answers, uh, conversation, uh, which I propose to dive into. So whilst uh, you are thinking about whether you want to ask a question, I shall kick off. I, um, not uh, la early last year uh, we had uh, um, some lectures uh, about trust and indeed I, I, uh, I gave one on trust in institutions so um, this is a, a little plug there'll be a book at the back it's recently come out you can buy a copy um, of all of the all just, not just my words but uh, I was uh, fascinated by uh, that analysis uh, you offered and I I want to ask about um, the place for these Christian virtues in our public institutions. Um, earlier this, uh, this month, we had here in, in St. Margaret's a uh, Thanksgiving service for the life uh, of Nigel Lawson, uh, who is uh, well known and well known as a, a secular Jew, indeed um, uh, uh, an adamantine atheist. Uh, and uh, his son uh, spoke about him from that pulpit there, followed by Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister um, of a, a non-monotheistic uh, religion, Norman Lamont, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, so bringing that all together, the Christian uh, insight into our public institutions, which are secular, so the uh, question really, how do, how do you think these institutions can interpret or embody, cultivate these Christian virtues um, in their own cultures? Is there a place for that? Thank you, Anthony, very good question. I think the, um, I think the first thing to say is, is again, you, you don't have to be a Christian to recognize both the nature of those crises, um, that there is an erosion of trust in public institutions, that there is a greater sense of anxiety for the future, that there is a, um, you know, we, we face really difficult issues when it comes to our relationships with our, with our neighbors locally and internationally as well. So um, that analysis is not, and I think also one doesn't have to be a Christian to recognize that actually we kind of need those three virtues, the faith, hope, and love, and that they are in a way foundational to a good, healthy social life. Um, and that, so therefore it seems to me that, that even in the kind of secular public space, this is a, an analysis that um, Christian faith can offer. It seems to me that the, the, the posture of the Christian faith towards a, um, a secular society is, is largely one of, one of witness 
we bear witness to the story that has formed us as, 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 as Christian people. Um, but at the same time, there's always a kind of overlap, if you like, between the story that we tell and the story of our, of our nation, not, not least because, of course, Christian faith has shaped the very sort of um, sense of, um, of what's important within this nation over many, many years. And so therefore, it seems to me there is a kind of resonance between when Christians speak about faith, hope, and love, and what many people feel instinctively, whether they're Christian or not, as to whether those things, are, are, are these being identified as things that need to be built. Because uh, you can't do everything. You have to focus on something. And I guess what I'm trying to argue today is that actually this particular set of virtues identified by the Christian faith, but not uniquely held by Christians. And obviously there are other faiths that can say other things about faith, hope, and love at the same time. Although I would say that it's, it's a uniquely Christian con configuration of things. That, um, that what Christians do is offer both that diagnosis, but also the resources within, um, within our national life. It's why I think institutions like the Westminster Abbey, uh, institutions like this church, uh, the close sort of interaction between Christian faith and government uh, can be such a sort of significant thing for our national life. It's not just about, you know, Christians getting a place at the table. It's about offering something of real significance for our national life together. Thank you, Graham. Do, do I think, just stay at, uh, at, the, uh, at the Lyginium or uh, lectern. Uh, and I'll uh, pass the, the first question just there to uh, the gentleman just standing up. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Andrew Hillier, I'm chaplain of the fleet, so head of the chaplaincy in the Royal Navy. Um, I wonder whether we, as a society, are, we look at the world almost like you, we look through a pair of binoculars but the wrong way around, or look, we look through a telescope the wrong way around. We see things in a very skewed way. I was, I was struck earlier on by your comments about Lucy Letby. There are nearly 800,000 qualified nurses in the United Kingdom the vast, vast majority doing extraordinary things and making extraordinary contributions to life and, 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 and doing wonderful, wonderful things day in, day out and almost always completely unrecognized. And yet we focus on the one, the, you know, the, 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 the particular rather than the general. Likewise, with, um, with, with, um, with migration, of course, millions of people, millions of people are migrating around the world every single day and yet we focus again on a few hundred migrants just coming across the channel in boats. Somehow or other, we have, got, we have completely skewed our view of the world. And it does strike me that actually the one institution that we seem not to have lost trust in, peculiarly, is the media. And, and through all sorts of ways, our media channels, you know, feed this sort of this this sort of skewed vi vision into our lives and we and we kind of believe it mm -hmm. I just wondered what your thoughts were yeah thank you the, the media is an interesting one I think um, journalists do come quite high on the kind of distrust um, score although as you say we, st we still read it and we still believe it um, and I think you're absolutely right it's true of all the professions I mean I, I, I've known many politicians over the years I don't think I know any of them who who have gone into it purely for personal gain, or to kind of you know, just, just out of a lust for power. And yet, very often when you go do these sort of social, these, these um, surveys in public, that's what people think about politicians. Um, and so often our views of these things are skewed in many ways. But I think very often perception is reality with these things. Um, so therefore there is a, there is a kind of responsibility on, um, uh, on media to kind of re report in a generalized way. But we tend to get, as you say, very fascinated on these one one particular case, whether it's a, whether it's a, um, uh, the Lucy Letby thing or, so, or somewhere else. And you know, she, she's a particularly um, significant, um, I think the, the reason why it was so shocking was because the NHS is so trusted. I mean, it all, usually comes right at the top of all the list of kind of trusted institutions. And therefore to have someone, a bit like the Harold Shipman case, was really a real kind of shock that doesn't totally destroy our, our trust in the NHS. Of course, we're still going to go along to our local GP and our local hospital when we get sick next time round, but it shakes that sense of trust. And the way we talk about it, the way we sort of spread um, those stories shakes that sense of trust. Um, and I suppose the question is, you know, whether we approach life with that essential um, default position of, yes, I will trust this person until I get good reason not to, or do I distrust this person until they give me reason to trust them? 
and it seems to be the first of those builds a healthy society and can cope with the idea of people being untrustworthy from time to time, whereas the second one doesn't. And therefore, we need to look for those kind of resources that do build a sense of trust within our society. Um, and it's why institutions need to be very conscious, I think, of the ability to build trust. It takes a long time to build trust, it doesn't take long to lose it. And uh, so therefore, that is something, it seems to me, for, the, for all our national institutions, I'd say the church as well, uh, that the building of trust is a, is, a, is a really crucial element of institutional life in our, in our nation. I'm Geoffrey Roper. I was, a long time ago, a secretary of the Free Churches Group. Mm. Looking back to the first lockdown, uh, and not everybody clapped on a Thursday night, but there was that spirit of trust in the health service, in caring professions generally, and first responders, despite the great anxiety which we all had about this uh, unknown illness and the sense of that uh, we had to create a new normal and it would be better once we got through the pandemic. Mm. There were some of the three points that you mentioned in your perfectly formed three-point sermon, um, which give hope. And yet, as we look back now uh, in the brokenness recognized in the recriminations as we um, trawl through the inquiry, into COVID, mm. one feels disappointed. And yet the vision was there and the sense of solidarity and even what at my great age I can call the blitz spirit. Mm. Um, people supported one another and tremendous support was given to us in the elderly and the vulnerable categories. Mm. Um, and the friendship that was expressed even when communication was hampered, mm. uh, gives me a sense of the vision which you presented tonight. Mm. Uh, any comment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you do, every now and again, get a glimpse of what a society like that could be like. Um, I remember, as many of you may know, when I was Bishop of Kensington, the Grenfell Tower fire happened in my in one of the parishes that I was responsible for. And um, uh, I can remember being, spending a lot of time in that local community. And it was quite remarkable, the sense of um, community that emerged, not just within that local community, but around the whole country, people kind of driving miles to bring something, to do something to kind of support this community at the time. And um, it was one of those moments when actually people, rather than head down, doing your own thing, uh, suddenly were looking out for their neighbor. Um, and it kind of lasted a few days. Um, maybe it lasted a little bit longer within that community itself as people looked out for one another, but then kind of things go back to their sort of normal way. Um, and I think we're, we're often, we, we see those glimpses as we did a little bit during COVID, that sort of reaching out for one another where the normal channels of communication were not possible. You know, we created WhatsApp groups and we did sort of wave at each other across the street or who's singing in the streets or whatever it might be, we could have found ways to do that because we, we have this instinct to kind of reach out to one another. But I think very often we're kind of uh, swimming against the tide of a kind of individualism within our culture that actually militates against that, that actually says that, no, no, my, my personal autonomy is, is absolute. Um, then actually that doesn't sit well with my kind of fundamental calling to, as Christians would say, to love God and love, to love my neighbour. And that's where I find my true self rather than... Um, in my own individuality. And so I think that's what's going on. We see those glimpses of, of a kind of connected, um, trustful, um, hopeful society, sometimes in the darkest moments. Um, but it's swimming against a tide which often goes in the other direction at the moment, I think. So, Graham, can you, can you build that? The, 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 um, quite a lot of, uh, of this is about the individual exercise of these, of these virtues, in a, in a sense, yeah. building up into a, a society, a stronger society. What, what about the, the virtues themselves in public life? Can, can you say something about how you, how you see that, perhaps from the centre's perspective? Yeah. Anyway. I think... Um, the virtues in public life, it seems to me that, that I mean, take, take hope, for example. Um, it seems to me that, that 
any society needs a sense of hope to, to, for, for the future. If it loses a sense of hope, if it's, it sinks into despair. And um, so whether you're talking about politicians, whether you're talking about a business, whether you're talking about the NHS, whether you're talking about the church, it's actually one of the primary functions of leaders within those institutions is to build a sense of hope, to speak hope, because hope is something you can kind of cultivate and encourage by the speaking of it. Um, and um, again, as a Christian, I speak that out of the belief in the resurrection. Um, but it seems to me that, again, you, you, that's, that's, that seems to, for me, that is the, the ultimate place that hope comes from. But again, you don't have to be a Christian to, to recognize that actually that's part of the role of leadership within any particular culture, within particular sort of organization. And so um, I kind of wonder if, it, if, it, you know, if, if all of our, our, um, our banks or uh, insurance companies or our um, institutions across the country, that actually leadership was thought of as being cultivating faith, hope, and love in this institution. Cultivating a sense of trust where we trust one another, uh, where we speak hope and we give people reasons for hope for the future, and where we build the kind of common life, where we give people reasons to look out for one another. Um, that actually that might begin to change the kind of character of our national life and our institutional life. It's so just a change to the way about um, thinking about how things are, things, things are... We'll give it a go here in the Abbey and, and let you know how it's we've been doing it for ages. As an, uh, indeed, yeah. indeed. Um, are there any other questions, please, sir? Great. Uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop Graham, thank you very much indeed. James Somerville Meikle from the Catholic Union uh, says, good to join uh, friends and making this a, uh, an ecumenical gathering tonight. Uh, I think your diagnosis was spot on in terms of trust, anxiety, relationships, and everything that Christianity can offer in terms of a remedy for that. I suppose my question is how we go about communicating that, mm. because it seems that we have suffered in the Catholic Church and all churches a fair amount of mm. uh, brand reputational damage, if you like, and it's extremely frustrating when there is so much we can and should be offering um, that people don't seem to want to listen. So how do we get people to look at us again and to see that to so many of the challenges we face that we have the solutions? Yeah, thank you. And it's a, it's a good point you make that um, this isn't to say that the church is a beacon of trust and hope and love all the time. It, the church is a place where trust is often misplaced and abused and a place where Sometimes it's hard to find hope and sometimes where you don't always experience love. Um, the church is at once the body of Christ, but also a deeply human institution with all the flaws of any other institution as well. And so we don't say this out of a sort of, you know, look at us, how wonderful we are as the Christian church, whether the Catholic church or the Anglican church or anywhere else. Um, but it seems to me that, that, it, that is, I often think that Christian church is a little bit like an oyster that, that actually looks pretty ugly and wrinkled and not very pleasant from the outside, but actually contains within it a precious jewel, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore that's what we, uh, our primary task is to, is to kind of hold that out, if you like, despite our failings and frailties. Um, how do we do it? And I think we do, um, I think we do, we do it in three primary ways. One is we do whatever we can. We tell the story of Christian faith. Um, which in some ways is a fairly simple story. It's about a God who made this world and who gave us everything that we have and yet a world in which it, we experience it as broken because of our own failings and frailties, frailties in it, yet a world that has been redeemed through Christ and is promised to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's a fairly simple story, but you can get into that in all kinds of depth. So I think that story needs to be told and retold in um, creative ways. I think we do it through... Um, uh, trying to, to see how, how Christians see the world differently it seems to be part of what we uh, do as Christians is that we look out on the world with slightly different eyes um, through the eyes of Christ, the eyes of the gospel. And we'd see how, and part of our task actually is to describe a world that is lit up by the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What does law and economics and geography and housing and politics and everything else, how does it look like when you view it through the lens of of the kind of faith, hope, and love that is spoken about in the Christian gospel. And I think we also tell our own story. 
Um, because alongside the stories of, uh, of shame and abuse within the church, there are remarkable stories of transformation. Um, and uh, as, a, as a bishop, you get to see the best and the worst of the church. Um, you get to see the worst, but you also get to see the best. You get to see those remarkable stories of lives that have been turned around by this new faith that has come into a person's life. And um, so I think we, we, those are the three things we do. We, we describe the Christian story. We, we, we try to interpret how Christians see the world differently and, and um, paint an imaginative picture of um, what that might be like. And we tell our own stories. I guess a, a, an example of that would be, I think the last time we did this well in the Christian church was probably back in the, in the 1940s when there was that great debate that went on in, during the Second World War over what would rebuild European civilization after the trauma of Nazism and the, the um, destruction of the Second World War. And right, right at the heart of that debate were a number of very significant Christian figures, not, not primarily clergy, most of them were kind of novelists and poets and playwrights, people like W.H. Auden and T.S. Eliot and Dorothy Sayers and C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and others, who painted a very rich imaginative picture of the world um, that actually captured the imagination of many people. And it's interesting that actually there was a the little, um, I mean, the, the figures of decline in the church in, in Britain have been pretty constant since the mid-19th century, apart from one little period at the end of the 1940s and 1950s when it all goes up. Now that may have been post-war austerity and looking for something different, but I think it was also because of this kind of rich retelling of the Christian story in imaginative ways um, it, that happened during those, those times. So that's something of the challenge that, that we have, I think, um, which is this, this bearing witness to the story that has shaped and claimed us. We uh, here at the Abbey are in a, a season where we are retelling the stories of the uh, 20th century martyrs that are the 10 figures on the, the front of, uh, on the west front, front of the Abbey, as it were, facing out into the world. And their lives tell the story. And, and that's perhaps one of the ways in which each of us individually can live lives that, that tell the story. Um, and, and they speak of the remarkable dignity of, uh, of, the, of the individual, which might come on to be my next question, but I, I'm just looking out across uh, the, um, the Crowley, just a microphone just coming uh, to you there, and uh, afterwards. Uh, I'll, make it, uh, I'll make it very brief. Uh, my name's Piers Carter, and I work as, uh, with the chaplaincy at HMP Rochester. Hmm. I used to be an advertising man, and I would like to stand up for them, please. I was a copywriter and creative director in Saatchi and Saatchi, and I found advertising men to be very trustworthy and incredibly generous. Um, we were involved in a great number of films for charities, never advertised uh, publicly, and nobody involved in any of those films charged a penny for their time. Oh. Well, I think that's quite generous, so we're not all stinkers. The other thing I would say is <coughs> uh, polls about trust. You can't necessarily trust them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I would also say on trust, uh, that wonderful things happen in prison chaplaincies, I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a chap who used to come to the chapel regularly, great tall fellow, about six foot five, and never said anything very much. And one day I asked him, why do you come here on a Sunday? He said, that's easy. Jesus is one bloke I can trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is now an evangelical preacher in the Gypsy Church. So trust is very important. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, perhaps we can uh, have a, uh, a final uh, question from uh, Bishop Allen, just here in the front. If Perfect. Thank you. I'm uh, Alan Smith, uh, Bishop of St. Albans. Yep. Graeme, thank you very much for giving us those three very positive, strong themes, which I absolutely love. Just going back then, picking up on, you were talking about the Renaissance post-war with uh, you know, T.S. Eliot and uh, Dorothy Sayers and so on. What was interesting was they, they, they told the story, but actually 
one of the features of that was they enabled you to look at the dark side. They enabled you to explore things like sin, yep. which we find very difficult today to mm. talk about. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're a strange society because in some senses we're very prurient and mm. very judgmental and mm. all the language of inclusiveness. Some of the people who talk most about being inclusive are some of the most excluding mm. um, people and, and find it very difficult to accept other views. How do we today talk about the brokenness of humanity or to yep. use the theological word sin yep. in a hopeful way mm. because i guess part of the problem has been we because we've not been able to do it we've rather set ourselves up and then been of course knocked down yep. uh, and yet that's such a fundamental part about the, mm. the 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 dark side of human nature the, the the nightmares the how do we deal with the dark stuff would be yep. i suppose what i'm uh, asking yep. if you just say something briefly on yeah yeah, that's right, and I think it is. It relates to the question a little bit earlier on about um, you know why do why do we focus on the one, so Lucy Letby, whereas there are so many other sort of nurses who are, um, who are really good nurses. And I guess the, the the point being that we 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 like we like to talk about other people's sin, um, or we identify the particular people. We tend to kind of divide the world between. I mean, I used to find this going into prisons again. You know, me with the bad people. But actually, in prison, you would find some pretty nasty people. You find some pretty nice people at the same time. Um, that, uh, that actually, that, that it's, it's, I think we need to sort of shift slightly from the, you know, the, that ten tendency to to sort of deal with brokenness and sin by kind of lumping it all onto one particular person or one particular group, whether that's immigrants or a particular religious group or whatever it might be, to actually begin to acknowledge that that the. Um, the sinfulness of every single one of us, as well as the loved character of every single one of us. And so that seems to be one of the most remarkable things that, that um, Christian faith says. I'm, I'm writing a biography of Blaise Pascal at the moment, and one of his great things is that you, you cannot understand humanity without understanding both human greatness and human misery. You've got to talk about both. You know, we are extraordinary creatures capable of immense uh, altruism and love and care and uh, we huge mental intellectual abilities, but we are also people capable of deep cruelty and harm. Uh, and we're all like that, not just one person. So I think that language of the brokenness of every human life, but yet the loved character of every human life, something about the tragic nature of human life as well, I think is important. So I've been thinking again about the Israel-Gaza situation and seeing it, seeing it through the lens of tragedy, where you don't jump to a conclusion as to saying who's right and who's wrong, but you say this is just a tragedy. That's the first way you, you talk about it before you go on to begin to deal with it. There is something about it that, you know, there is a, a tragic element to Christian, to Christian, to, to human life that Christian faith identifies, but it doesn't just leave it at that. It also goes on to say actually that um, this is about this alien dignity idea again. So it seems to be something about democratizing sin, I think is what we kind of need to do. We're all in it together. Um, but the good news is that we're all in the, with the possibility of salvation and recreation and newness. Thank you, Graham. I'm, I'm sorry to have to draw uh, such a fascinating uh, discussion uh, to, uh, to a close and uh, really to offer my uh, thanks to uh, you all for attending, Graham, for providing us the, 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 the platform and the, and the richness from which to explore. And I, I, I just end with, or you end with that, uh, that sense of hope and uh, resurrection and, and is, uh, Israel-Palestine situation. There in the despair, um, uh, there is hope and we look for that uh, for uh, for a, a future. So um, just thank you so much for this uh, deeply relevant, deeply thought-provoking and uh, rich lecture. So perhaps we could... Uh...